your heart be troubled Hold your head up I don't feel no evil Fix your eyes on this one truth God is madly in love with you Take courage, hold on, be strong Remember where your help comes from I know the night 
We believe the author of this book was the brother of Jesus. So quick question, how many people are only children in the room? How many only children do we have? Okay, we just learned something about each one of you. I'm not gonna say what we learned, but we learned something about each one of you. So the rest of you all have siblings then. If you're not an only child, that means you must have a sibling or have had a sibling at some point in your life. Um, this is a picture of my twins very early on. And I think it's the most beautiful picture of sibling rivalry I've ever seen. Because here we are trying to take a picture, and Mackenzie, I like to think, is like, I don't want to share my picture with you, Julian. I want my own picture. And Julian's just like, I have no idea what to do with this right now. She is screaming in his face. I mean, the whole, I'm so glad we have this, like, on our photo wall. It comes up every once in a while, you know, as a memory on Facebook. We just laugh and laugh. But I wonder what it was like to be a sibling of Jesus. Like, could you imagine? Like, at what point did James figure out that Mary had a favorite? <laughs> because we all do. Even when you say no, every parent does. I wonder when James figured out he was at least second on the totem pole, that the Son of God took precedence over him in the family. I wonder what it was like to grow up with a brother who was literally perfect. You ever say that when your parents are getting down on you? Like, like you, you just think that they're perfect. It was actually true in the case of James and Jesus. Like, it must have been a very interesting relationship to be in. And then what must it have been like for James to come to realize that his brother was actually God's son? The Messiah that the Jewish people were waiting for showed up in a carpenter's family in Nazareth. And you were the brother of the Messiah. What was that have been like? And here what we have is actually in James the first letter that got circulated throughout the churches when the churches had just been formed after Pentecost. We believe that James was probably the earliest letter we have in the New Testament. And what's very interesting about it is it's kind of like tucked in the back. It's a very short little letter. And it's right in the back, and I think a lot of people miss it for one reason or another. You know, in the Reformation days, it actually kind of got a bad reputation. Because, of course, the Reformation was the uh, movement in the churches to move away from the Catholic system to something else, to move away from a works-based system to salvation through grace, which we still believe. The challenge is that James is a very practical, works-based book of the Bible. And so actually, Martin Luther is on record for saying he thinks that James is a lesser book of the Bible. Which I don't describe to you. See, I think that, that rather than having a hierarchy, I don't know, maybe you're one of those people that grew up in a tradition where it seems like Paul was like the ultimate biblical writer. Like everything Paul wrote is more important than everything everybody else wrote, maybe except the Gospels. And we have this funny hierarchy in the way we think about the importance of, of Scripture. But I think, I think, see, when God was writing Scripture, he had all of these, imagine this, imagine a round table for a quick second. Imagine that God has sat down all the writers of the Bible, and he said, here's a framework for which I want you to tell my story. You're going to tell it in your ways, for your days, to your people, in a way that makes sense to them. But each one of them stands on their own as a legitimate articulation of the story of God. So there is no greater or lesser. And what happens is, of course, we have, to, we have to wrestle because sometimes it seems like Paul and James don't get along. And maybe they didn't. Maybe they didn't actually. Maybe they had different perspectives. But see, our opportunity is now to look down on it all and go, okay, I've got to wrestle because God ordained Paul and God ordained James to the same degree. And so we still have to come back and wrestle with it. There are no lesser books of Scripture. And James is famous for this one line. What's the one thing you think of in James? Somebody give me one verse you know from James. You all know this one. Go ahead. It's faith without deeds is dead. You've all heard this before, have you not? This is not new. 
given to us. And this is almost the summary of the book of James. If you need to hang on to one verse, faith without deeds is dead. Because here's what we believe, that missional people, we've talked a lot about being on mission in the last number of months. So if we're a missional people, we dealt with all this. If you weren't here when we did the things on being a missional people, that's okay. It's all on YouTube. Praise the Lord. <laughs> missional people work out and work on their witness in the world by allowing Christ to shape the way that they behave. Right? We are not purely a people of mental ascent. But we are a people who believe the things that we believe will shape the way that we act in the world. And those actions in the world are often how God draws other people to himself. Faith without deeds is dead. So this morning we're going to start in James chapter 1. If you have your Bible with you, it'll be a really short little verse. Because this is, of course, I just lost my place in the Bible. That's what I'm going to do. We're going to, every week we're going to look at a few verses in the book of James, and we're going to get really practical about it. Sometimes around here when we, when we do studies, we go line by line, verse by verse, it's lots of scripture. These ones are going to have pieces of scripture, and we're going to flesh them out in real life, okay? So it's a bit of a different kind of series. Incidentally, the material that we have for this particular series, and the one that we have from the last one King of Kings that, were, that we just finished, come through the folks that have helped us with our small group curriculum. Um, and one of the reasons we're doing this is to kind of give you guys a sneak preview of like, what are some of the ideas and concepts we might do in group life. We want you to know that as, as time evolves here, we're going to have ways for you to get involved in group life coming up very, very shortly. Barry and I were just talking about this this morning. Yes, Barry? Yeah, we were just exchanging some emails. And so Barry and Gary help us uh, get our small groups administered. Uh, and we want you to know about that. In fact, next week, we're going to have the other things I was supposed to do before I started, but I got really excited. Next week, we are going to uh, share with you a little bit about some digital tools that we have to help you with getting connected to small groups and getting connected to giving and those kinds of things right here. So watch out for that. I don't know if you need another app on your phone. Probably not. But this is going to be a good one, so just wait and we'll get you into that. Anyway, today's big idea from James comes from chapter 1, verse 19. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. Because human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. You know, sometimes when you're preaching, you preach things that you feel like you have some kind of handle on. And sometimes you have to preach things that you don't feel like you have a handle on. And I want you to know before I start today, that this message is mostly for me, okay? And you guys just get to listen in. When I was prepping this, I'm like, oh, Lord, there are so many things here that I have no right to say anything about. I'm going to do my best to give you a couple of pieces that I've been trying to implement in my life to get better at some of these things. So let's break them down one by one. Be quick to listen. Hmm. That's easier said than done, isn't it? Listening more than you speak, being quick to listen, is easier said than done. How come? Well, there's at least two things that I found in my own life really make listening difficult. The first one I'm going to call distortion. Why? Because I'm a guitar player. It's a musician joke for anybody in the room. But if you think about your capacity to listen, in the same way we think about a wave, okay, a, a sound wave. At some point, you get to the edges of your capacity to listen, and your environment influences how much you can listen. But people around churches are always like, Pastor Tim, can we go for a coffee? Or Pastor Tim, can we go to a restaurant and have a meeting? And I'm like, would you like me to listen? Because I am terrible at it when there's other inputs in my life. If I go to Brown Social House with you, I will hear 50% of what you have to say. Why? Because there's sports on the TV. <laughs> and it cuts off my ability to listen. Right? All of a sudden, my wave is now peaking. The, the amount of input is now going past a certain line. And when it gets here, it just cuts off. And I can't hear what you're saying anymore. It's not because I'm rude. It's 
not because I don't want to. It's because if I was born today, they would probably call me some version of ADHD. I just can't hear you. And sometimes it's really soft and you won't notice it. And sometimes it's really hard. See, these ones are still kind of like round a little bit. And this one gets flattened off right at the top. Your environment matters when you're trying to listen to people. So if you're actually going to take this, like, be quick to listen. If you're having a significant conversation in your life, do it in an environment that promotes listening. Why? Because we care about the people that we're listening to. As followers of Jesus, we are called to see others more highly than ourselves. And if that's true, and our love is reflected in how we listen, we need to take charge of the environments in which we listen. If somebody gets together and wants to have a significant conversation with you, do it in a place that actually allows you to listen. For me, it's any place that's a place of sports. Don't ask me to come if you really want me to listen. That is not an environment in which I can listen well. And we need to know that. We need to control that. We need to be in tune with that in our own lives. It may be different for you. The second thing that makes being quick to listen easier said than done is how fast your brain is. And it betrays you the older you get. Why? Because you have a memory about when you used to be really fast. So when I moved from Toronto to London, when I was a kid, you guys might not know this, but you know, like I used to be an athlete many, many years ago. I used to be an athlete. I played soccer and hockey when I was growing up. Okay, and so when I moved back to London at the age of 35, some of my friends were playing in a broadly defined adult soccer league. But this adult soccer league had people all the way from like 21 years old, like teams full of Italian kids at 21, and then teams full of men who were past the prime, like me. But you see, your brain still remembers when you used to be able to keep up with the 21-year-old Italian kids. And so you're trying to run so fast that you break yourself. Because your brain is faster than your body. Right? Your brain actually thinks, I can keep up with that. So you keep pushing and pushing and pushing. And what happens? You end up hurting yourself. That year, that one year that I played soccer, I tore my quadriceps. I buggered up the meniscus in my knee, and I missed more games than I played. Because I thought I was fast enough. Now, the games I played, they were pretty good. I still had the memory of how to do the skills, but see, my brain was trying so hard to keep up or push me to where it thought my body could be. The same thing happens when you're listening. People talk at a rate of about 125 words a minute. Your brain is infinitely faster than that. So, this explains why when people are talking to you, your brain is listening to them, but then goes off and finds something else to do. When it gets bored, why? Because it's simply faster than the person who's talking to you. Your brain moves more quickly than people's words. Do you ever find yourself finishing people's sentences? <laughs> like somebody's talking to you, you're going, yeah, 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 I know what you're about to say, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> right? Does that ever happen to you? Women, do your husbands ever do that to you? I do it to Melissa all the time. It drives her bananas. She was in the room right now. She had the biggest amen ever. Because she knows that this is something I need to work on. You know, because lazy brains go off and do whatever or finish sentences, and they don't engage with the people, and they don't give them time to flush themselves out, and they don't care enough about what people are saying. Right? We're just so into our own thoughts that we actually damage and hurt the people around us because we're not listening anymore. Here's a quick strategy that I found <clears throat> for helping me to slow down and have a real conversation. And it's based on the little word here, which is really helpful because it'll help your brain to remember. Okay, here it is. So the first thing you want to do, halt. If somebody is talking to you, stop whatever it was you were previously thinking about and actually tune in to the person that's speaking. Engage with them. Fully look at them. Tune your body towards them. Okay? Actually tune in to that person and engage with what they're saying. A, 
Anticipate, but don't anticipate in a way so that you're ready to say your own words instead of theirs. <clears throat> Just when your brain starts to do that thing, go, okay, good, I think I know where they're going. Let me see if I'm right. Come back to the conversation they're having, not the words you now want to say. And lastly, replay. In your conversation, sometimes you call this active listening, okay? It was the one thing I didn't want to tell you this morning, because I feel like whenever somebody says, listen, active listening is the only answer they have. But there are things that you can do before that to actually give yourself the ability to connect and hear. And Christ followers, I mentioned this a minute ago, but in Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, we are the people who are called to value others more highly than ourselves. Listening is an entirely Christian activity. We should be the most tuned in, dialed in listeners on the planet. And imagine what Christian witness would be like if we were known as the people that people could talk to the easiest. How would that change people's perceptions of who we are? What is the world's perception of the church when it comes to listening and engaging in dialogue? I'm not going to go there because it's dicey. But I don't think we're known as the best listeners on the planet. And I'm suggesting maybe we should be. Second thing out of James 19. Be slow to speak. Whew. I don't know which one is the hardest one. Every time I read one of these, I'm like, gosh, this seems really difficult. Slow to speak. Does anybody like talking when they're in a crowd? I like it so much I found a job. <laughs> But imagine that I was um, as cool as one of these young people in a room. You do this thing, same thing at like Brown Social House or what have you. You get a table full of people. Some of you will know this about yourselves. So you're there. Imagine Pastor Tim is still young and cool, and we're talking, and story after story comes out. And people are laughing, and people are just lobbying. And all of a sudden, you get to the end of the hour that you had together, and you go, gosh, I didn't give very much room for anybody else to say anything, did I? That ever happened to you? Believe it or not, there are people that can talk me under the table. And I've been in things where people come and they say, can we have a meeting? Really what they said was, can I talk at you for 45 minutes? And I'll give you five to respond at the end. You ever been in those conversations? You ever been the person who gave that conversation to someone? What in the world do we do? Look, self-awareness is something that we've talked about actually a fair amount in the last couple of months. Self-awareness is the ability to stop at the end of that conversation and go, what did I do wrong? And create a pathway for changing it in the future. Do you ever get out of those conversations and once you figure out that you've said too much, you actually have like some internal repentance? Gosh, I shouldn't do that again. You know, our brains are actually designed so that we've got a frontal lobe that's supposed to be like the thinking part of our brain, right? And then, and then Parts of our brain that are buried deeper, that are all based on emotion. I totally stole this from somebody a couple of weeks ago, so if you're on the leadership board, you've heard this before. We were doing some training, and uh, Krista, who I mentioned before, is helping us with our, with our board training right now. She was talking to us about this very topic of self-awareness. And what we want to do is get to the place that feels really good. It feels really good to have everyone listen to you. It feels really good to make people laugh. And when you find yourself in those places where the, the good feeling part of your brain takes over for the thinking part of your brain, what you need to do is you need to create a pathway from the front of your brain to the back of your brain. Don't let your brain be lazy. It wants to go to the feel-good part. It wants to bypass the part that God gave you to think. Well, at least he gave you, man, if you're after 25, you have a fully developed one of these women did it earlier, which is why all of our daughters develop quite a bit faster than our sons. But this front part of your brain takes a while to develop. Once it does, what you need to do is connect these two parts of your brain. How do you do that? Self-awareness. Sit down with yourself afterwards. If you were the person who talked way too much, talk to yourself about how that's not appropriate behavior. And what you're going to do is like, it's like creating ruts in a farmer's field, right? If you drive the same path over and over and over again, all of a sudden you're going to have something that resembles a road there eventually. You're not going to have to take the rough terrain every time. Self-awareness is massive in learning to speak less. The third one, be slow to get angry. Again, for some of us, this is easier than others. We've talked a 
little bit about some self-awareness tools around here. One of them is Enneagram. So, so Pastor Tim is number eight. If you want to like read a shockingly accurate description of my personality, go find an eight with a seven wing online and read it. One of the things that you'll read about is that eights live with their anger right below the surface all the time. Okay? And a good eight knows how to control it. And a bad eight is out of control. I'll let you decide, this guy, he, he's either got his stuff in control or out of control.
These are all things that I could work on. These are all things that I would confess, God, I find it challenging to control. But God, I care and want to care increasingly deeply for others in my life. To actually let other people be more important than myself. Thank God for our church. I pray that each one of us, as we go through James and we talk about these incredibly simple, practical ideas, that you would gift us with your holy self-awareness. That your word would do the heavy lifting on what we need to do so that we can be missional people whose actions become aligned with your word. And so we are a witness to the world about your goodness and your grace and your love. God, as we sing this morning, would you... Uh, let your joy flow over us. Would you help us to be in tune with your spirit as we leave us a place to go about our week? We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand and sing? You have poured out grace You brought me out of darkness You have filled me with peace O oh, giver of mercy O oh, my help in time of need Lord, I can't help but sing Faithful you are Faithful forever you will be Faithful you are All your promises are yes and amen All your promises are yes and amen
Father, we come recognizing your faithfulness in our situations, each one of us, how you've walked through this journey with us, even as we've been separated and not connected. Father, you have been faithful to each one. You have been kind. You have poured out grace. And so even as we're alone in our each of our homes, Father, we can feel that you are with us and know that you're with us. So we rest in that and we're thankful for that. You are so good, Father. And we say yes and amen to all that you want to do in and through us. In Jesus' name.